Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to update the House today on some of the measures that my party colleague Deirdre Hargey instigated as Minister for Communities to ensure that the Department for Communities could support people who are affected by COVID-19. As members will be aware, as part of the response to the current pandemic, my department introduced a number of emergency changes to the discretionary support scheme. These measures included increasing the maximum income a person can receive before coming and eligible for discretionary support. This means that anybody with an income, income of up to £20,405, whether they are in work or receiving benefits, may be eligible for a payment. We introduced a new discretionary support self-isolation grant for people who have been diagnosed with COVID-19 or are advised to self-isolate in accordance with official guidance. With the introduction of this new grant scheme on the 25th of March 2020, we ensured that people here in the north who are on low incomes were amongst the first to be able to access specific financial support. There simply has been no comparable support available to most people in Britain. I am pleased to note that the rapid response of the Assembly in approving the necessary changes to the discretionary support legislation, alongside the effort of my department in implementing the changes, has had a very real and direct impact on so many people. This is clearly evident by the extent of the support already made available. The latest available information shows that between the 25th of March and the 31st of October 2020, my department awarded 14,800 self-isolation grants with a total value of 2.1 million. This is money going directly to the people who have found themselves in a crisis situation during the pandemic. However, it is clear that we all continue to face unprecedented challenges as the effects of the pandemic show little signs of abating. It is therefore essential that we continue to monitor the support that we can provide to ensure that, to ensure that we are helping the people who need it most. I have decided that it is appropriate to introduce some of the enhancements to this scheme. These changes do not require new legislation, and I have therefore instructed my officials to implement the revised policy immediately. The changes I have made are designed to enhance the level of financial support available through the self-isolation grant. It is hoped that this will be of particular benefit to people who are temporarily unable to work. In practical terms, my department will now use higher daily rates of benefit when calculating the amount of an award. Decision makers are also now expected to take into account the impact of the financial shock of self-isolation when calculating the number of days to make an award for. This is appropriate as a sudden and temporary reduction in normal income levels will mean a person is at greater risk of experiencing hardship. Therefore, an award of living expenses to cover the whole period of self-isolation should now always be considered. I firmly believe that the discretionary support self-isolation grant offers an enhanced overall package when compared to other areas. For example, the Irish Government has provided support for people required to self-isolate based on a fixed week weekly payment which is treated as a taxable income. In England, Scotland and in Wales, the test and trace, trace payment offer fixed amounts of £500 for 14 days regardless of family circumstances. This payment is only available to people who have been told to self-isolate by the NHS Test and Trace Service. They must prove they are unable to work and have lost income as a result. The payment is also taxable. The self-isolation payments available here are targeted at those people who are in need and are always assessed based on their personal circumstances. This means that rather than a fixed payment, regardless of the size of a family, we will always take into account all dependent children and include them in the award. For example, under the new rules, a couple with three children can receive £683 from discretionary support to cover a period of 14 days. This payment is not taxable and further awards can be made if the family continues to find themselves in a crisis situation. 
These payments will also not affect any future applications to discretionary support. The self-isolation payments can be made if a person is self-isolating as they or someone else in their household is displaying symptoms. Entitlement is not restricted to only those people who have been in contact and told to self-isolate. I would stress again that if people continue to find themselves in a crisis situation after receiving a self-isolation grant, then they can also apply for further support. There is no limit to the number of grants that can be awarded. I also strongly believe that the enhancements introduced to the scheme are another important step to strengthen an already comprehensive package of support. So, to conclude, the discretionary support self-isolation grant is a very important and accessible means of providing financial support to those people who are affected by COVID when they need it most. We know COVID-19 has widened the gap in our communities and has impact impacted people differently. It, ha it has had a disastrous impact on the people and families who are already struggling. People should be supported to isolate if they need to without fear of going under or being further penalised financially. So that's why I'm improving the level and the duration of financial support available to people who are eligible to apply for it. I will continue to keep this under review and will welcome your feedback as we need to make sure we, are, we keep providing support where it is needed and when it is needed. Gormagad, and thank you. And I call uh, the, committee, the chairperson of the Committee for Communities, Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I promise I'll be a lot shorter this time than what I was the last time with my four questions. Can I first thank the Minister for a very welcome statement and also for the good manners last night for calling me first and, and informing me of what was in the statement? And a Minister will know that statistics show that 80 per cent of those in part time employment are female, with some having more than one job and many working within the hospitality sector. And they're already facing real hardship um, uh, coming up to Christmas and beyond uh, with the, with with the hospitality sector, never mind facing a, a, a notification that they have to self-isolate. So this is very, very welcome, and I'm sure it will help many, many families. But I just want to touch on another issue, and that's the issue of fraud. We know that people are um, missing appointments um, at our test centres and are receiving positive um, test results from that. So I just want to ask you, are there any safeguards in there when it comes to fraud? Because we want to really be to distinguish between those in need, and that's what this is for, and those that is just sheer greed. And I thank the member for her question. Um, the member will know that there have been problems with the, the test and trace app. Um, but I have to say, our department is working with people on the basis of need and what they ask for as part of their application process. If, like any other benefit, it's found out later that there was fraudulent claims, then we'll have to deal with those. But up until now, most people who have contacted the department have been genuine cases. And as you said in your preamble to your question, a lot of those people are working at least two jobs. And if they have to isolate, this is a lifeline for them. Um, so I would imagine that most of the claims, if not, I would say them, them all, are completely genuine, and that's the approach that will be taken. I call Sinead Ennis. I want to thank the Minister for her statement today and also for her continued good work to ensure the people who need our support at this time are actually um, getting it uh, and that the, the support available here far outweighs what's available in other jurisdictions. Can I ask the Minister uh, what is your department doing in terms of raising awareness of the um, enhanced support available because uh, we want to make sure that there's maximum uptake um, of the, the grant. Thank you. Well, I think the first step is actually reminding people that this help is out here today, because it's quite clear while many people, almost 15,000 people, have applied for support, for discretionary support, there are many others. We're hearing this all in our constituency offices who are completely unaware, and actually think it's a loan rather than a grant. So from today, from making this statement, I will also ensure that our media outlets, our advice and welfare networks, and indeed our constituency offices all have this statement because they are usually, particularly our constituency offices, they are usually the first point of contact for many people. Um, and when people contact us, particularly around something like this, they are in distress. So we need to minimise that for people who need our support. Nicole Mark Durgan. 
Greta Kionkolia, I thank the Minister for her statement and very much welcome her decision to increase the amount of support that some people in desperate need can get. However, what we want to see is an increase in the amount of people who can get that support. The prohibitively low income threshold of £20,400 per household means that many, many working families and individuals remain ineligible for financial assistance. Their bills don't stop as a result of having to self-isolate, and many are left with the extremely difficult decision as to whether to follow the government guidance or to work to feed their families. Will the Minister consider raising the threshold? I thank the member for his question, and he will be aware that Deirdre Harkey actually increased the threshold, and I'm going to look at this again, because you're right in the sense that we need to have more people apply to this grant because they need it, um, but we also need to make sure that it, it's actually going to be supportive, it's going to be a help rather than a hindrance. Um, so, you know, talking to officials again this afternoon, that's one of the questions I would be asking if we can do this. Uh, without impacting on party. Um, and even though this Assembly, and you'll know as a member of the committee, legislation was brought through and accepted to increase this, I'm looking to see what I can do within my barriers to make this easier for people who need it most, particularly getting into the winter months, particularly if they're at home, they're eating more and they're eating more. Um, and we need to make it easy for people not only to get access to this, but to ensure that they qualify for it. I, call Andy and I echo the comments of colleagues around the chamber in welcoming this uh, much required uh, enhancement, Minister, and thank you for bringing it forward. Minister, my constituency office team and I have supported many constituents to avail of this grant, and, and as you've highlighted, it is a lifeline for many. With, with that in respect, can you advise uh, the average time taken to process the claims and any steps that you've taken within the discretionary support system to ensure that claims are processed efficiently? Uh, well, I'm being told by officials that uh, the applications are pro processed in as quickly as quickly as possible. However, and even in my own constituency office, I have received reports, and even people have sent me reports through social media to say that's not the case across the board. So this will be my commitment to you all is that I will be reviewing this almost on a weekly basis, because I need to ensure the people who need access to these payments get them. They get them in a timely fashion, uh, and they get them when they need it most. So I would again urge members, if they're hearing any reports to the country, please let me know. Thank you. I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you very much, Minister. Um, any enhancements to any, any um, payments that can be made to people who are vulnerable at this time are very welcome. So thank you very much. Um, your statement indicates that the, your frontline staff are the decision makers. Um, so I'm just. It's a bit like Ms. Ennis has asked today. It's about that promotion and knowledge that people have. How much training will your decision makers have? And do you have enough money for this? Have you got enough money set aside in a grant to pay this out? Because hopefully people will take this up. Well, the decision. So thank a member for a question. Uh, the decision makers, each change that is made regarding this support or any other support, the decision makers will have it again and again and again because we need to ensure consistent information is going out. Yes, there is enough money in the budget um, for now, um, but the important thing is that between now and the new year, we need to try and give people the support to self-isolate, because as the chair of the committee said, there are people who are making decisions that they can't afford to self-isolate. And we all know that the rate of people who have to self-isolate or are impacted by COVID hasn't abated in a way we had hoped. So we need to really try and support people to stay at home and also to stay at home with some support. It's our obligation to do that. I call Alex Eason. Um, thank the Minister for her statement and it's a good news story, so well done. Um, could I just reaffirm with the Minister that anybody who has to self-isolate three or four times will still be able to apply for this and will it affect people with tax credits as well? Well, the, the, the answer to your question, and I thank the member for his sentiments also, um, as said in the statement, this, people can apply to this um, when they need it. Uh, unfortunately, because of the length of the pandemic, some people have had to isolate at least, at least once, and some others a lot more than that. 
It is a non-taxable uh, grant, so therefore it should not impact on tax credits. Um, because we need to make sure that what we give on one hand is seen in the other, and that is not the case across other jurisdictions, so we do not want that to happen. And Many people who are in tax credits are already on a low income, so we need to ensure that when this support is given to them um, after their application, that they are getting they know exactly what they are getting and they know exactly what they have. Thank you. Nicole or Leah Flynn. I can call you. Uh, Mr. Allen already touched on it in a previous question, but does the Minister foresee that um, today's announcements will lead to an increase in claims and then possibly further additional um, delays with the, the processing of the cases? Thank you. Well, um, I hope, I would really hope that there is an increase in people making applications because um, while almost 15,000 have done up until now, we know there are many others who are out, self, out of work, self-isolating, impacted, affected by COVID. Um, I would hope uh, that there are no further delays, but as I said to other members, if she or anybody else has concerns or, you know, or hearing reports that there are undue delays, then get in contact with us, because that's not what we want, that's not what I want. Uh, and that's not what the officials want, because they're processing these applications as quick as they can to get them out into people's bank accounts and into their pockets as quick as they need them. Call Palm Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I also want to thank the Minister for her statement to the Assembly this morning. The discretionary support self-isolation grant is a lifeline for many people um, on low incomes who are required to self-isolate. Uh, so I very much welcome that news that the daily allowance payable has been increased. Does uh, the Minister agree that these grants are crucial for encouraging and enabling um, individuals to complete their period of self-isolation? And could I ask if your department is working with the Department of Health or PHA to take the opportunity to provide additional information uh, as to what actually is required around self-isolation uh, within this process? I thank the member for her question, and she's right, it is a lifeline. Um, and as a, an MLA with, I'm sure, a busy constituency office, we've all got the distress phone calls and our constituency staff have done so as well. Um, through the executive information, through the, the information website, through our discussions with health colleagues in health and PHA, we are genuinely trying to ensure there are no gaps. Um, so again, in response to the question that Mark Durgan, I will be that that's on my list for discussions with the officials just to be sure to be sure. Because I've heard too many reports that people still felt that this was a loan, and that's why they didn't apply. So something's gone wrong. Um, and we need to ensure that any clarification that is needed is provided after the statement this morning, and that every aspect of government is aware of it. Because we're all living in each other's shadows, um, as we should be. Um, but one department shouldn't be around another department to find out what this is about. Everybody should have the same level of consistency when it comes to this information. Nicole Park, Cadney. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you for your statement. Um, it has to be welcomed. Uh, Minister, I, was, um, I want to welcome the easier uh, payment method that will be used in the self isolation uh, payment. I know that 4,800 uh, people were successful with their applications up until October, but I was wondering could the Minister inform me how many people were unsuccessful? If I don't have that information. It's, f it's 14,800, Pat, so it's almost 15,000. But the issue is that I don't have the information of how many people were unsuccessful in terms of the data from the department. I have the anecdotal evidence. I have the people uh, you know, reaching out to you by email through our assembly emails through my consistency office and indeed on social media to tell me differently, so there's an issue. So I think when we get through this, we'll start clicking uh, through each of the questions that have been raised and we'll put this down for clarification. And if we do have that data, I'll certainly share it with the member. Nicole Emma Rogan. Minister, um, today you have outlined <clears throat> how the support compares to what is available in Britain. Could you give us a, a brief outline of how it compares to what is available in the South? Um, well, 
the question um, in terms of other, other jurisdictions will be that it is taxable in other jurisdictions, including the South. It is also for a fixed period in other jurisdictions, which it is not here. Um, and indeed, you know, the difficulty that I have uh, certainly with the, the other jurisdictions is that they are giving it to people on one hand and they are taking it off them on another. And I think that is grossly unjust and grossly unfair. I call Trevor Clark. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and like others, I welcome the Minister's announcement. I think those who are on low comes will welcome this announcement. I think it is a, a very worthy uh, statement for you to make. Um, but given that some of these people are low workers and will be returning to work after that two-week period, is there any protection afforded to them in terms of their employers, um, where I am sure there are cases where employers do not want to release these people, and whilst money is one thing, they are probably looking for job security as well? And is your department doing anything in relation to that to actually give them the guarantees that employers can't move towards them during their periods of isolation? Well, the, the issue that I have always had um, with the fragility, particularly of zero-hours contracts, um, is that people are even more vulnerable and they're more susceptible to um, exploitation if any employer is minded to do that, or for want of a better term, any employer wants to chance their arm. Um, employees have rights, uh, and we'll remind them of the rights that they have. And if there are any indications or examples of where uh, workers feel that they haven't been given the due respect, or indeed the due entitlement from their employers. I would certainly would welcome hearing who they are and where their employers are, uh, and I would be happy to share that information with the member's colleague, Diane Dodds, the Minister for Employment, because I am sure she would not have this either. Well, John O'Dowd. Uh, can Corley and thank the Minister for her answers thus far. The mantra for months now has been that we need a proper test, trace, isolate support. We now have in place a scheme which now allows low-paid workers to isolate and they will receive the support. The Minister indicated earlier that she was looking at the level of, of income a family could have uh, to, to claim the support. How quickly do you think she will be able to carry out that review? Well, I, I, I mean, as quickly as I am looking at the, rev the review and the questions that have been raised, I would be putting the officials on notice. I would be wanting to get the data, and certainly in relation to Pat Catney's question, try and capture the data of people who were rejected. Um, and certainly, I mean, as a member will be aware, Deirdre Hargy increased the threshold. Um, if I need to do that, and if I can't do that, I will be looking to do that, because people may think £20,000 is 20400 is a decent enough wage, but if that is your only income and you are paying all your bills and you are rearing your kids, um, it all adds up. So we need to ensure that people who need the support get the support, and we will find out very, very shortly about uh, if the level of income does need to be increased, because if it prevented people from getting access to support now, then it is a problem we need to look at. Call Colin McGrath. Mr. Speaker, um, Minister, the 14-day self-isolation period starts from the date that the message is delivered to the COVID app to a person's mobile phone. Um, this often is not 14 days from the, the person was last in contact with somebody with COVID-19. Would the Minister agree with me that an urgent and timely rollout of the update to the app is crucial, as that could see the amount of time that somebody is isolated and reduced in some instances by 13 days, which would therefore ensure that your department has more money to spend? Well, I agree there are issues uh, with the app. You know, for even four people actually get a confirmation of a test result, either positive or negative, the fact that they are going to get a result is that they have concerns. And in relation to the question that Trevor asked, you know, we want to make sure that employers are adhering to that good practice because it's, we're asking people if there are any symptoms, de isolate straight away. And what we can't do are ask people to follow government guidance and then have them and have their salaries and have their, their um, money deducted because they had to wait two days on a result from the app. So the app needs to be obviously we all need to make sure it's better. But I want to make sure that as soon as people apply for this, that they get it as quickly as possible and not been held back by further bureaucracy, which is not of their making. 
call Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, I thank the Minister for her much welcome statement. Uh, this will come as a relief to many and also the reassurances that she's going to look at the threshold, which we in the SDLP welcome. Uh, Minister, there are people out there literally saying when they come into contact with someone and get the alert, I can't afford to isolate. Uh, and that's a very difficult place for many to be in. Uh, and any support from this Assembly uh, will alleviate that pressure. Minister, you spoke of parity, but this scheme, while according to uh, yourself is more generous than elsewhere, it is much more difficult to access, according to reports. What was the Barnet consequential derive from the introduction in Westminster of the self-isolation grant, and has all that money gone into this scheme? Thank you, Minister. So um, I received Amy, so it's an Amy um, issue rather than a Barnet, because it's benefits related. So the money's there, um, but the issue is that, you know, if I understand the member's question properly, there were issues regarding people uh, having the clarity if it was a grant or a loan. And we're, we all heard too many stories that people felt it was a loan and they didn't want to get into any more debt. But the issue is we as a government are asking people to self-isolate and we can't ask people to self-isolate and not support them. And that's the bottom line. So that's what we're trying to do. Will there be lessons learned as a result of this? I'm sure there will. It's like anything you bring forward. You need to accept the good parts, change the parts that didn't work, and try and make it better in the future. And basically, rather than waiting on a perfect fit, we just need to get this out, get it changed, get it out, get it clarified, and hopefully people get the support they need. I call Jerry Carl. Thank you. Thanks, Minister, for her statement. Um, the 14,800 people uh, divided out. Uh, equally amongst the 2.1 million would amount to around £150 received each. I'm assuming people got less, people got more. So is the Minister aware of the average payment that people received and how many people uh, received uh, £500 or more? Thank you. Well, it's, it's actually it's, it's better uh, than the £500 because the £500 or even the €350 Euro, um, is just fixed and it's also taxable. Okay? So, if you take £100 of that, or €100 Euro, or €140 Euro for tax, it's less. So, for example, if a couple have three children, they can receive £683 for the 14-day 14, 14 period. So, if that's one set of isolation, if the same family come back six or seven weeks later and had to isolate, they can expect to receive the same amount of support. That's not the case elsewhere. And as as long as this pandemic goes on, the more families are impacted by COVID, at least once that they have to isolate. And I'm hearing of families having to isolate two and three times. And we have to ensure that we support them because we're asking them to follow government guidelines. So when we're asking anyone to follow government guidelines, we need to make sure the support is there, be it for discretionary support, be it business, be it wherever. If there's hardship there, we need to try and get support out to people. Members, that concludes uh, questions on this statement. I ask members to take a raise for a couple of moments to be moved to the next item of business. Thank you.